Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Goldstein. I'm the Chairman of Trustees of the Lord Mayor of Birmingham's Charity Trust, and we welcome you to this quite unique event. Uh, firstly, I must thank Simon Topman and the Millennium Trust team for arranging for this event to take place in their premises and fixing all the internet and online um, technology that, that's been needed. Um, it is not a fundraising event as such, but I would just like to tell you a little bit about the Lord Mayor of Birmingham's Charity Trust, which of course is perennial um, and is always supported by the incumbent Lord Mayor. It is to raise funds for any and all charities that need a little bit of help who are doing work for the good of the people of, of Birmingham and, in, and Birmingham based. Particularly the smaller charities that don't have big overheads and big teams where a few thousand pound grant will help them to keep going. And indeed, not only doing that, but working with them to mentor them to stand on their own two feet. Of course, COVID has meant a lot of charities have really struggled and I'm pleased to report that our latest grants meeting we have um, given, agreed to give grants to some 15 charities uh, based in Birmingham to help them through the difficult times. We would love you to get involved with us, to talk to us and help us to help the people of Birmingham. I'd like to thank Andy Street, the Metro Mayor for the West Midlands, and Liam Byrne, MP for Hodge Hill, for taking part in this event, and all those that have sent in questions. What we have done is taken a selection of the majority of questions, which will be asked by Simon to the two uh, candidates um, and we hope you enjoy listening to it. It is our wish and desire that we put on some live events, um, live by way of being able to attend events, but that probably won't take place till after the spring. Please register with us. Enjoy, enjoy the afternoon's proceedings. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Millennium Point. My name is Simon Topman. I'm the chairman of Millennium Point. Millennium Point is the only remaining Millennium charity, and a highly successful one it is too. Every year we give away £1 million to STEM organisations, people who are going to build our future. That's what we do here, but this afternoon we're doing something entirely different. We're hosting what is possibly the very first um, talks to be given by West Midlands potential ca candidates to become mayor. And with us this afternoon, we have two. First off will be Mr Andy Street, who will be well known to you, I'm sure, as the incumbent mayor. And then that will be followed by Liam Byrne, who would like to be mayor. Let me say just a few words about Andy Street. I know he's extremely well known in the area. Um, but he really is a, a, a Birmingham boy. He went to school at um, King Edwards. And, of course, he was the first elected mayor of the West Midlands way back in 2017. He had an extremely successful career before becoming mayor at um, John Lewis, the most successful workers' cooperative in the country, where he rose from graduate trainee to managing director. And since then, he has played a lot of political roles in helping to advance not just the West Midlands economy, but the West the economy of the UK as well. Um, let me 
go straight into questions. Um, we've had a lot of people register and register their questions, many of which were um, quite similar. So we have culled from those the most popular um, set of questions. And let me get off with the uh, first one straight away. Um, Andy, how soon, if you are re-elected as mayor, how soon could you build zero carbon homes at scale in the West Midlands? And how do we fund the cost differentials, especially where the homes are used for low cost rent? Should the West Midlands have its own affordable homes program like London does? And how would you tackle the region's most challenging issue around brownfield sites that still need remediating? Over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. And indeed, uh, great to see you here and to have, I hope, a few people listening in. You never know when you're doing this, if you're talking to yourself, but it's great to join you this afternoon. So coming straight to your question, Simon. Uh, I think there's two elements that you asked that are, dare I say, reasonably straightforward, and we've got lots of evidence. One that's actually much more tricky. So I'll take the, perhaps the straightforward elements first. In terms of brownfield remediation, I think we have been doing exactly that across the region. Last year, we built uh, 17,000 uh, homes across the region, the huge majority on brownfield sites, so we must be. And if you look at perhaps the most contaminated place in the West Midlands, Phoenix 10 and Old Copper Works, just on junction uh, 10 of the M6 in Walsall, we are now using funding that the combined authority has secured alongside Walsall Council to bring that back into use. Huge number of football pitches. So that will once again be creating jobs in a few years into the new mayoral term. So I think there's actually a really good record on that. And I would say there is probably nowhere now that is too contaminated in the West Midlands to bring back into use. Right. So are we well on stream for your personal targets? As we are on terms of housing numbers. Uh, and uh, brownfield remediation, we are definitely well on stream. We agreed across the whole region a target of 215,000 new homes by 2031. That target was set in 2016. And actually on last year's strike rate, we were on target, if not a wee bit ahead. Being entirely honest, we wait to see if this year we'd been knocked a little off target with the uh, pandemic, of course, but we definitely were on target. Now, the second part that I might just come to is this question of a very straightforward question. Should we have our own affordable housing scheme like London? And uh, the answer is categorically yes. This is frankly a frustration to me that uh, the only area of the country that the government has devolved affordable housing funding to is to London. And if you look at our record on housing developments against London over the last three years, we have definitely made much more progress. So I am utterly determined in the second term of the mayoralty to get that out of central government. Their excuse, interestingly, is London have had 20 years, they're a much more mature area, we've had three, but second term, it would be a very appropriate thing to ask for. In the meantime, of course, we've got on and made sure that any of the housing developments that we fund through the combined authority, we have a minimum 20% affordable ratio, and that has been honoured, and last year we achieved ahead of that. So we've done what we can, but straight on to a straight question, yes, that is an absolute commitment that we need to secure that funding from central government. Now, the third question is perhaps the most interesting of all of the, the three bits of your overall question. This one about a zero uh, carbon house in, um, uh, in how quickly. And I would actually say very quickly. Now, that might surprise you. But we are, if I give you again a practical example, down at Port Loop, just at Finladywood, we are building with Urban Splash uh, modular houses built off site. And actually, they are very uh, uh, energy efficient already and we would want to extend that to a commitment literally for zero carbon. We've set up our sort of brains around this, the zero carbon task force in our housing and land board. So we've got the ingredients coming together and I would want us to get to that new point very soon. And one of the things, just last quick point on this, that we're asking for the government for funding at the moment is 50 million subsidy for us developing out our capability in this whole area of new methods of construction. So actually lots of the ingredients are in place and I think we can even become a leader in the country in doing this. So I hope the answer will be very, very soon. We'll have our first demonstrator home like that. OK, thank you very much for a very full answer. Um, the next question, a very popular one that a lot of people sent in. What can be done to rejuvenate the Birmingham 
High Street. Following the demise of the larger retailers who are responsible for the um, foot flow in Birmingham, Debenhams, Arcadian Centre, um, what can be actually done about yeah, that? Yeah, OK, this is a... It's very topical. It's also extremely difficult. And we'll come to the city centre, which I think is what people are thinking of in just one moment. But let's just put two other things on the table, first of all, because this is not all bad news about retail. Actually, one of the effects of the pandemic is some of our suburban centres have actually had a real lease of life. People want to shop locally and that's good. So there's good news there, the local centre. There's also a lot of good news in this sort of industrial and um, uh, um, properties that are supporting online retail as well. So let's remember, there are some strong points of retail as well, but it's left us this real problem in our big city centres and town centres across the country, uh, where indeed my old employer, John Lewis, ab abandoning. So the answer is what we're going to do. I think there's probably four ingredients that we're set out on, and it will need some public money to ease it on, actually. Four future uses of the city centre that I see. There'll still be some brilliant retail there. And let's just think Selfridges, Primark in Birmingham City Centre, superb businesses, not online, so real successful. There will need to be more housing in the city centre and we're going to see some of the old retail space turned into housing and probably offices. The whole sort of Rackham's development planning gone through there, the Martineau galleries as well. So the retail core will shrink and that's probably a good thing because it will be stronger for its shrinking. Then we will need to see actually more innovative leisure things come into some of those spaces that are let. So if you think of that John Lewis space above New Street Station, I don't think that's going to be a retailer again. But I think it will be something incredibly different about leisure. And if you walk around these malls in China, you begin to see some of the sort of leisure things that have come into malls there. So I think, or Middle East, you see those leisure loose uses in malls. I think that will happen. There's a huge advantage of that space where all the trains connect. And then the other thing we will see is more public services in our city, in our, in our city centres. And we're, we're working with our health trusts at the moment, for example, to bring diagnostic centres, screening centres, again into that place of most footfall. So what you will see in the city is some changes of use. And I'm sure, though, that when we bounce back from the pandemic, what we will see is that people still want to meet socially, still want the leisure, the hospitality, the culture. That will bounce back but we'll see slight changes of use from the retail. And you know what? We've got to give planning permission quickly for it. We've got to put public money to subsidise some of it. And all of that's got to be a shared endeavour. OK, will that be led, do you think, by uh, the West Midlands Mayor? Or is it something that will be market driven and you've got to facilitate what the market yeah. wants? Yeah, interesting question, Simon. It, it'll be a combination of all of them. A lot of it will be market led. After all, people have got to put their private investments on the table. Some of it will be led by the public sector, though. So we, for example, are seeking the funding for putting these, uh, these diagnostic centres, these health centres in the places of greatest uh, footfall to bring it to communities who perhaps don't do as much health screening as they should do. Some of it will be local authority. The planning changes need to come from local authorities. And some of it, of course, has to be our, our, our landlords who own a lot of that. And there's a real role for people like me to encourage those landlords to get on and give that commitment to change. So it will need to be, and it's why I said, it's got to be a team endeavour to make those changes. But you certainly see a vibrant future for that city centre here I, in Birmingham. I do, and think back. C cities have changed so many times already in the last 200 years. It will be a change again, but we want to meet one another in sociable places. That's the lesson of the pandemic. Oh, I'm sure we're all missing that at the moment, absolutely. Um, changing tack a little, um, another question that was asked many, many times. During the pandemic, there has been support to accommodate homeless individuals who have no recourse to public yeah, funds, right. either due to an asylum claim being refused or as EEA nationals. There continue to be severe destitution among these groups, especially when COVID-related Section 4 asylum support ends. Brexit in January is coming along, and that again will further change benefits and entitlements. What are you planning to do to support these vulnerable individuals, of whom we seem to have increasing numbers, and help them and reduce their numbers and the numbers of rough sleepers, sleepers that we have in, in this city. Okay, so um, I think there's two parts to this. There's the number of rough sleepers, 
to give them what you've just said, and then there's the specific about the asylum seekers and those who don't have recourse to public funds. And I think everyone except they are two different groups. So let's just very swiftly deal with the rough sleeping question as a whole, and then we'll come specifically to that group. So the rough sleeping question as a whole, we have actually made good progress over the last few years. And uh, we're waiting for the counts. It's a horrible way to put it, but it's uh, what actually happens every year. And I'm sure it will be confirmed again that there have been less people sleeping on the streets than there were. And that has actually great irony, uh, but thank, good, thank goodness some good has come from it. Uh, that actually has been helped by the approach of everyone in during the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, we were making good progress. And of course, the flagship approach that I hope it's fair to say I have led is the housing first approach, where now 300 people have moved into accommodation of their own from entrenched rough sleeping, as we call it. And that's about giving people an opportunity, a new start in life, accommodation, and the services that go around them. And we will be pushing, if there was to be a second mayoral term led by me, for further funding for that housing first, because we've demonstrated it works. And that is actually a real breakthrough. Then a subset of people is, of course, the, those who you particularly referred to, asylum seekers and those with no recourse to public funds. So what have I already done about this, Simon? I have uh, approached government and to ask specifically with the Homelessness Task Force across the West Midlands for an extension of the exemptions to the, the way that the, to, to allow them basically to be supported uh, and to prevent going back to the situation that was there before the uh, pandemic. Uh, we're waiting for government response to that, and I think it is very straightforward, the reason for this. For very understandable reasons, the way in which asylum seekers, uh, asylum uh, applications have been processed, have been held up during the pandemic, and it is nobody's fault that they have not had their uh, application processed. So it is quite right that until they are processed properly and they're caught up, that they are exempted from the previous rules. So that is a live request right now Cross party, cross the region, from the homelessness task force uh, to ask government for that exemption. Okay, and what about young people? This is a very young city here in Birmingham, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you. Um, how will you seek to engage with that young person's agenda and be on track with them to move our city forward? Yeah. Well, I think whatever I'll say, people will say, "You old codger, you can't possibly be in touch with young, uh, in touch with young people." And there's a terrible risk. Uh, people like me saying, oh, yes, we know, we understand. It's, it's hard. Uh, I suppose I would point to a really clear piece of evidence, though. And I'm actually quite proud of doing this because we didn't have to do it, but it was the right thing to do. So um, the Combined Authority Board is possibly not surprisingly made up of people roughly my age who lead councils, lead local enterprise partnerships, and indeed those who we see from big business, often people leading charities, whatever. They're a certain generation. So that isn't representative. I'm well aware of that. So what we have done is we've set up what we call a young combined authority. It actively shadows the main uh, board. And uh, at every board meeting, we ask them for their views. So their voice is in the room and we hear it. And I don't mind telling you, sometimes it's been pretty uncomfortable. For example, when they talked, or, and it's always different representative members of the Young Combined Authority, when they talked about their reaction to the Black Lives Matter protest, I think there were a few people uh, sitting around the board table a little uncomfortable. So Simon, we've actively brought that voice into the room and I hope we will continue to do that in a second mayoral term, because it's been, it's been brilliant to hear it, actually. Good. And turning to the hospitality industry, no one needs to say what a disaster COVID has been for that very important section of our economy. Is there anything you see yourself as being able to do in yes. the, the role of mayor to help that beleaguered part yeah. of our world recover and recover back to where it was and perhaps even move yeah. forward and improve. Yeah, It will recover, this sector, because as we said earlier, people want to go back, don't they? So it will, but there's no question it's been gruesome. And um, I mean, really, since uh, March, uh, it's been desperately hard going. We had the 
little peek in August that you need to, to help out, but basically it's been tough going. And I think this has been a really good example of where the mayoral role can directly intervene to help. And I'll tell you the story. Um, we were put into tier two on, I think it was the 11th of October. Uh, and that was particularly damaging for hospitality because obviously then people could not meet someone from outside their own household in a restaurant, a pub, a cafe. And that meant, of course, hospitality's takings were through the floor. So I acted immediately to get on the telly, get on the radio, uh, write to the uh, Chancellor, and within 10 days, he had put specific support for hospitality in Tier 2 on the table. And he said on the floor of the House of Commons that I had rightly represented the hospitality sector here. I think he said I'd been vocal, might have described it to some of his friends as I'd been a pain, frankly. But uh, that's what you have to do on occasions. You have to stand up for the sector. And I hope it wasn't enough. I fully accept as it's now moved on over the next few months, uh, it's certainly not enough. But at the time, it was a decisive intervention, which I genuinely believe that I've helped bring about. So you can stand up and represent a sector like that. Where we are right now, though, Obviously, in Tier 3 coming out of lockdown, it's even worse, and the grants that are there are not enough. I'm very clear, again, you can have a look on the social media, a letter's gone off to Rishi Sunak, we've been doing Radio 4, Sky News, you name it, interviews about this. And remember, this is against my own government. They're the same party as me, but on occasions, if they get it wrong, you have to speak up for the people who you represent. And I think I've done that effectively, and I'm very optimistic to your point about rebuilding that what we will see is a change from government, possibly extending the period that business rates exemptions apply to hospitality, continuing the period of 5% VAT, giving more time to repay the loans, and we hope, but this is perhaps the toughest ask of all, but I hope uh, that they will agree to increase the grant, because basically £3,000 a month is not sufficient, particularly for the losses at this time of year. Okay, sticking to the economics of the situation mm. um, f for the moment, You've already mentioned in one or two of your answers how you would like to seek increased government help for mm. the West Midlands and we're putting a strong case for mm. better funding for all sorts of things. What advice would you give to the government as to how it should now handle the huge debt we all know we already have and more of it yet to develop? What would you say to them as the way that they should approach that? I would actually say £394 billion pounds borrowed this year is an enormous amount of money. When you hear it, your eyes literally water, and you and I were brought up on times where only a fraction of that <laughs> would not be allowed. Uh, but it was the right thing to do, actually, is my first reaction, because um, I've always thought that um, this pandemic would be gruesome, but it would come to an end. And what matters is what we're able to protect and preserve that's there to grow back. Now, we've paid an enormous price, public price, that three, nine, four billion. But if businesses are there to grow back and all the other things that make up the way in which we respond, local authorities, everything, if it's there, we will grow back stronger. So I think I, my advice to government would be, don't lose your nerve in supporting us in what might be the last part of this crisis if we are genuinely going to come to an end with vaccination. And if you have to dig that little bit deeper in the next few months so that there is more there to grow back from, that is the right thing to do. There will be a time where that has to change, but it is not yet. We've got to begin to see that growth coming back. And frankly, we're extremely lucky that this has coincided with a time of very low interest rates. So actually the interest that government is having to pay on it is very, very small. But it would be the wrong call to try now to call time before we're able to grow back. And is the West Midlands economy going to be able to cope with and offer future growth that will lift us out of the bit of a hole we seem to be digging for ourselves at the moment? The West Midlands economy has struggled for some time. There's a great lack of confidence. We don't have um, the economic growth that London and the South East has by a long, long way. Can we do it? Can you do anything to help us do it? 
course we can do it. You shouldn't be such a doubter, Simon. And <laughs> think about your business. Your business is an example of not having doubt. So of course we can do it. And let's just be clear, of course we don't have the wealth of the South East. Of course not, uh, in London. And that's a long-standing issue. But if you actually look at what's happened over the last few years, actually the West Midlands has performed, before COVID, has performed really well. Uh, Birmingham City Council, not my party. They say, quote unquote, Birmingham was booming before the, uh, before the pandemic. The actual stat, five year growth in the West Midlands economy, 22%. So we were doing well. And the reason I pull that out is that should give us confidence that if we protect, we can grow well again. And we've got one or two incredible advantages, Simon, that will help us grow again and grow back. One of them just outside the door, the biggest public investment in infrastructure anywhere in Europe is right here. That is literally tens of billions of pounds. And think of the jobs. It's tens of thousands of jobs in the construction and then the investment that's coming on the back of it. That will help us. And actually the Commonwealth Games, that's a billion pounds of investment just in what it's costing to stage it. And then, of course, we've got the opportunity to promote businesses around the world. Uh, we're just about to launch our trade promotion around that. So again, another opportunity. So we've got a few special things that are going our way on the bounce back. But the thing that says to me, above all else, that we will bounce back is the youth and entrepreneurship of our population. And that will see us through. And will Brexit have much effect on this region, do you think? Um, and obviously nobody knows what the outcome were in the final stage and these things are never settled until no. two minutes to midnight, don't we all know? Oh, it? to be a fly on the wall <laughs> at the dinner tonight, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we export a lot to Europe in this region. We're pretty tied in. Uh, and if it does all go wrong, it might not be too clever for us. It'll be yet another hurdle for us to, to overcome. What advice would you give to um, to Mr. Johnson, if you were over there with him this evening. Oh, what, I've told him. What, I've, all, I've tell told us, him what, before. What have you told him? What <laughs> Whether you he listens him? is another matter. Uh, no, uh, I've told him, and uh, you know, I've been utterly consistent about this, that uh, the West Midlands needs a trade deal. Yes, we can honour Brexit. That was what people voted for. Uh, but we need a trade deal. And it's very straightforward. 24% uh, of our wealth in the West Midlands comes from exporting goods. Just to hear this stat, it's only 8% in London. So it does, as you implied by your question, Simon, it really matters here. And if our goods had a tariff on them being sold into the EU, of course it wouldn't help sales, which ultimately doesn't help jobs. So I'm absolutely clear, I want the Prime Minister to complete a free trade deal to enable West Midlands businesses to continue to be able to sell into the EU. I also want, by the way, when we leave, uh, uh, the EU formally, uh, that we do conclude our trade deals with other countries around the world, because that, of course, was the whole objective of Brexit in the first place. But uh, we need this free trade deal with Europe. And who knows, as you say, no one can know what the negotiation really is about. But uh, I'm still an optimist that common sense will prevail. And community spirit has been very much to the fore mm. during the pandemic. We've um, seen a lot of people going out of their way to help with all sorts of matters around health and looking after neighbours who perhaps couldn't go shopping or elderly people who needed support. Um, perhaps a little bit of the old wartime spirit has been returning. How can we keep that going? Ah, brilliant question. Um, I've learned two things about this in the pandemic. First of all, and definitely a way of keeping it going, um, a lot of people have turned to their faith organisations in this for inspiration and guidance. And I think the faith organisations have done a brilliant job becoming sort of like almost part of the structure of delivering, whether it be delivering food advice, whatever, health advice. Uh, so they definitely have got to continue to be locked in to all of our structures. And whether it be the combined authority or the city council, we've really pulled them into our structure to help do all of that. But then I've also learned uh, that the voluntary organisations that all uh, across the city and the region have done a brilliant job and we've all been out visiting lots of them. We tried in the CA to bring them, uh, tell the stories of them on our website and go on and see, you know, click into your space. What are the organisations that do different things? And actually, 
what I've learned is we've got to continue that sort of whole network of sustaining all of those organisations. Even if some of them set up specifically for COVID and their purpose has passed, they will definitely still be there, part of, you might call it, like the, uh, the third emergency service almost. And on skills and jobs, um, at Millennium Point, big interest to us. We're charged as a charitable trust with trying to provide skills specifically around STEM, which we think is a big part of our um, future. We hope you agree with us too. Of course I do. Yep. Excellent. No question. Um, a lot of children have not been to school and children go to school and then somebody has the, the COVID virus in their class and a whole year group is sent away again. And there's no question that a lot of education has been missed. How are we going to catch that up? I, skills and, and jobs rather than education itself is, is perhaps your remit yeah. um, as mayor. But how are we going to catch this up? How are we going to make sure that our skills in this region, one of the least qualified regions in the country, sadly, mm -hmm. how are we going to move that mm -hmm. forward? But a region that was making great progress pre-COVID in our skill levels, I mean, really encouraging progress. So uh, I have this lovely graph, um, which can sound a bit anarchy this, but it just shows the proportion of people qualified up to level three. And you know what? It had gone up every year over the last years, quite dramatically, over 50% now, record high. We're relatively improving our position in the country. So there was huge progress. And that was about lots of people doing brilliant things, not one organisation. But the, perhaps the thing I would just call out in this, uh, uh, in this particular environment of COVID, thwarting people's jobs plans, stopping them in their track, I get that. And some people probably falling out of jobs that they thought they'd be in for years, I get that. So I think the critical thing we can do in the CA is this work, where we work very closely with colleges actually, on retraining. And we're talking just actually this last week, or we've been launching what we call our sector-based work academies, because there are sectors where uh, jobs are growing. Obviously, construction, we've talked about HS2, for example, digital, healthcare, logistics, all of these areas. And we're saying we will provide with our colleges very practical training that guarantees people getting as far as a job interview with an employer in those sectors. So we're trying on a unprecedented scale actually and also unprecedented collaboration all of our colleges across the West Midlands coming together to do this it's not been done in this way elsewhere to get people those retraining opportunities so if things didn't work out quite as you expected or you might be in a retail job at the moment that, as we talked earlier is ending there is a new opportunity through that retraining that's a very practical thing we can do right now. And do you feel our training organisations, whether it be further education or schools themselves, appreciate what the skills of the future are going to, to be, what's needed? Yeah. Um, do you feel that as West Midlands Mayor you're doing enough to make sure they are guiding our children and young people onto the right pathways? Uh, I think we've made huge progress in this, actually. And uh, the, ev when I knew we were making progress on this, um, I'll tell you a story rather than just give you my opinion. Uh, when I knew we were making progress on this was when I was invited along to a college, which will remain nameless, I think it's unfair because people think more about others. Um, uh, and the principal sat down with me and he said, Andy, let me show you the curriculum for this year. And let me show you how we've changed the curriculum to reflect the industrial strategy of this region, i.e where we think the jobs are going to be in the future and what we think the skills are for the jobs. And he'd matched all of his courses and he showed me that 70% of the courses were directly related to the areas we were saying jobs are going to come in the future. So actually, Simon, I think there's been steady, quiet, critical progress that actually training is now for those jobs. And if you look at our adult education budget as well, that the combined authority leads, uh, I'm also confident that there's been a huge swing in that towards programmes that are directly relevant to people getting sustainable jobs of the future. And do you see those jobs as growing rapidly? I and mean, every, every economic commentator that I seem to read um, is of the opinion that we could face some very heavy unemployment 
in the coming year as the furlough schemes and other government support schemes for yeah. employers come to a, a final close and there is presumably or is there you may feel differently um, a limit to how far government can keep on paying and keep on paying and keep on paying so if that is true it is most likely that it will be the young people yeah. who suffer That's right. most they're the easiest if you're an employer to to push aside mm. they will be the ones who will feel they've been left behind and they won't be very happy about that and there could be an awful lot of them so are you optimistic that we can handle that and if so how can we handle that mm. or or is it a problem that is too daunting for us to really know what to do with mm, right. critical question um, it's going to be really difficult Nobody's sitting here saying uh, this isn't a really, really big problem. Uh, just to give you the numbers, the uh, numbers of youth claimants have uh, doubled since March. So there, and I think the latest number for the conurbation as a whole was 43,000. So this is a very substantial problem. And if I denied that, you know, people would say you're in cloud cuckoo land doesn't lead me to think it can't be addressed because actually this is about some of the things I've just been talking about. Individual programmes to address this so that people get the right skills but it's also about another thing we've been talking about, making sure that we protect businesses to be there to demand people to come into work with them and that's also why I said earlier on, it's absolutely critical we continue to do that. It's also about us winning some big investments. You, you people know that I battled, lay down literally in front of the non-existent track to win HS2. That's 10,000 jobs. You'll know that we've got on in the CA and spent our money on uh, transport projects. That's thousands of jobs on housing schemes that we've talked about. So it's about creating the demand and also creating the skilled people. And we do know that we've got to steadily drive down that number of 43,000 as the economy recovers. And if, you're, if I'm very honest with you, Simon, that is the single biggest challenge that we've now got, which 12 months ago we did not expect to have. So it's about acknowledging it and leaning right into it with practical plans. And in terms of diversity and opportunities for all, uh, we certainly have a quite amazing rainbow of people out there. Um, how are we going to make sure that they all are offered a fair slice of the cake and can make their contributions to our world? Yeah, uh, we have a brilliant uh, diversity, as you say. Why we were so successful in bidding for the Commonwealth Games. Remember that statement? This is the Commonwealth City. So you know, it's a huge advantage to us in all sorts of ways. So the answer's uh, really clear to this, that every one of the things we do in the combined authority, we uh, ask ourselves, is this driving inclusive growth? Is this giving more opportunities to perhaps the communities which would least likely get them? And I'll give some, we have that theory, and then in practice, to give you a really good example of this, if you take our digital retraining funds, we are particularly looking to make sure that women who might not naturally be able to go on a retraining course because of their domestic commitments, possibly, and also members of minority communities who have less strong take up of digital skills are particularly uh, focused on in those activities. So we do choose particular providers who will reach in to perhaps the uh, communities who might naturally have less opportunity. So we're actively trying to address that imbalance. And that brings us very nicely to the close of our session. Um, Andy Street, thank you very much indeed for coming down to Millennium Point um, to talk to us this afternoon. And to everybody out there, thank you very much indeed for sending in the questions that I've been able to ask on your behalf to Andy Street this afternoon. Um, coming up later, we have Mr. Liam Byrne, uh, local MP, um, Labour candidate, who um, is Shadow Mayor. And I hope you'll be joining us again shortly um, to hear what he has to say. Until then, good afternoon for now. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Millennium Point. Um, some of you will have uh, seen our first section with um, Andy Street, the uh, Mayor for the West Midlands. 
But to those of you joining for the first time, let me tell you very quickly just a little bit about Millennium Point. Uh, Millennium Point here opposite what will become the HS2 station that's um, going to be built just over the road um, on the east side of Birmingham is one of the few surviving Millennium Charities. This trust has been extremely successful. We give a million pounds every year to people who support STEM, especially around education, and who we hope will be helping to build our future. We very much support young people. With us for this second session is extremely well-known local MP, the Right Honourable Liam Byrne, who is MP, um, Labour Party member um, for Hodge Hill. Um, Liam is also effectively the shadow mayor for the West Midlands. His political career has been um, extremely impressive. He's a former cabinet minister and has held a number of very high ministerial um, positions. He's now putting himself forward to be um, the next mayor for the West Midlands. So before I get into questions that have been sent in by people looking in now, um, Liam, can I ask you to say just a few words about how you see the West Midlands developing and if you are elected mayor, how will it look in five years' time? Mm, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me along and thank you for organising this um, in the run-up to Christmas. So, look, the truth is we're at a fork in the road. Um, this has been a tough year. I think the stories of loss and love that I've heard this year are stories that will stay with me for forever. The stories from nurses about their battle on critical care wards or you know the stories of you know the the mum who never got to hold her newborn baby because she died of covid before she had that chance or the kids who were saying you know goodbye to their you know mum and dad or on on whatsapp i mean th th this has been heartbreaking yet all earthquakes have aftershocks and if the treasury numbers are right published a week or two ago they imply that unemployment in our region is going to rise 40% next year now are we really saying that after all of the sacrifice, after all of the agony of loss, we're going to accept a reward that means hundreds of thousands of our neighbours on the dole? No way. We cannot accept that. And so what we've been doing over the last three months is talking to hundreds of thousands of residents about how we build a new future for the heart of Britain, the, the, here in the West Midlands. And I think what's really emerged from that is that this is not a time for us to be prisoners of our modesty. We all know that here in this region we are uh, we're more the workhorses rather than the show ponies, um, unlike some of our neighbours. But three big ideas, I think, have emerged from, from what people have said to us. Number one, we've got to go big, go for growth and go green. We have made history in this region by inventing the future. So why don't we now set our stall on becoming the first net zero carbon city region in Britain? That is the way that we can go green and create good jobs for the future, making the things that the world needs to cut carbon but create good new careers here. So that's got big implications for the way that we create green industry zones, um, for the way that we rebuild the skills system in a way actually that you've been arguing for for some years, the way that we roll out renewable energy. You know, right now we, I think we make something like 0.3% of the, the country's renewable energy. Um, and it's got big implications for actually using the power of public procurement to buy the things that we make here, whether that's very light rail in Coventry or building the bullet trains for high speed two in the black country or ex using public procurement to support firms like LEVC in Coventry or, or JLR. So becoming the capital of green manufacturing, for me, that's goal number one. Two, we need to do that in a way that creates better chances for young people. We're the youngest city in Europe. It's why it was such a slap in the face when people voted against free school meals for some of our youngsters because you know, frankly, that is bad news for young people in this city. I'm a dad of three kids here in Birmingham. I'm worried about us bringing up a lost generation right now. So I think we've got to put youth workers back in every neighbourhood. We've, we've got to bring our schools and colleges and universities together with organisations like yours to create a programme called Tomorrow's Engineers, educating the engineers of tomorrow. And crucially, we've got to start building council homes again so that our young people can start a family in a place they can afford. I think the final piece of the puzzle for me is everything that we cook has got to be with that special spice called community spirit. We're one of the most diverse regions in Britain and what we know here is that communities that look out for each other 
are, are safer and stronger. And that's why we've got to use the City of Culture down in Coventry and the Commonwealth Games to kickstart a decade of togetherness. We've actually got to use the Commonwealth Games and remember that our success will be judged not just by the medals that we win, but by the lives that we change. And that means using the legacy programmes to transform the way that we train our young people as leaders in the art of bringing people together and creating an arts and sports set of facilities in the city that aren't just in the city centre, but are you know, right throughout the suburbs. And I suppose the final thing for me obviously is, if there's one reason I'm standing for mayor, it's to end hunger and homelessness. I've worked with the food banks and the homeless community here in the city for the last four years. I just don't think it's morally right that we have cranes in the sky and homeless people dying in doorways. I'm just not prepared to accept that. And so if there's one thing that I want to see us achieve in the next four or five years, it's ending hum hunger and homelessness. And actually, good people coming together, rallying to make this happen, frankly, I think we can do it. OK, well, thank you for those comments. In fact, um, you may be interested to know that um, you have already touched on um, a lot of the questions that have been sent in by listeners and, and viewers out there. We, we've had a lot of questions, and so we've done a bit of a, a cull, because a lot of them were the <laughs> same question, really, um, and picked the most popular ones. Um, and a, a big, big question that's come up time and time again, and you've already touched on it, is young people. We've had children not able to go to school, we've had children go to school, and then there's been an outbreak of... Covid in their school and they've been sent home again and sometimes whole year groups have not had schooling for some time <clears throat> and of course skills are very important and part of the remit of um, the West Midlands Mayor is skills and jobs. Do you think there's anything you'd be able to do for those young people who have at school at the moment to make sure that they don't miss out, that they do have the skills that they need to survive in life and to bring this economy in the West Midlands up to speed? I think we have to. I mean, you know, when I talk to, to teachers in Hodge Hill, I mean, God bless our teachers, quite frankly. I mean, what they've gone through this last year has frankly been heroic. But what teachers in my constituency say is that they're really worried that all the gains that they've made in recent years have been wiped out. Lots of our young people don't have technology at home. There might be quite a few kids in the house, but only one laptop, no printer, no Wi-Fi. So, you know, we really are at risk. Of, of a lost generation right now. And that's before you get into questions about the new pressures on mental health for our young people. So I think there's three or four things we need to do. So one, we need to remember that young people are only in school a bit of the time. Actually, they, a lot of their education is outside school. That's why I'm passionate about putting youth workers back in every neighborhood. Our youth services in the West Midlands have been hit twice as hard as the rest of the country. So it's a real crisis for us. Second thing, though, I mean, I, I know you're passionate about this as well because it's part of your mission here at Millennium Point, but I genuinely think we should be bringing the schools, the colleges and some of our universities together to create a clear fast track to educate tomorrow's engineers, including, I might say, especially, I might say, our daughters who are underrepresented mm. in engineering. Now, the Royal Academy of Engineering, they think that we're probably training somewhere between 39,000 and 62,000 too few engineers each year. But that's always been our skill set here. And my great grandfather came here um, you know, from, from Russia and Denmark years ago because he'd, he'd heard that here, if you can draw it, we can make it. You know, we've got a special place as, the, as a, you know, the cradle of tomorrow's engineers. So I think that's the second big thing we can do. Third, we've got to sort out mental health services. Mental health services are far too hard to get um, for young people. I think there's something that we can steal actually from Greater Manchester. So Andy Burnham, who I was in the cabinet with, um, has developed this idea called the Opportunity Pass, which is about giving young people a range of cultural, civic uh, activities outside their immediate postcode. Um, and I think, you know, the last thing that we need to do is, is actually about power. So we actually launched our Young People's Coalition last night with our Shadow Minister, Kat Smith. And we need to be giving our young people far more influence over the way policy's made in the region. If you, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of this year just watching in awe, well, last year I guess now, watching in awe at the, the Birmingham Youth Climate Strikers or the young people who organised the Black Lives Matters protest um, in, in the middle of town. Our young people right now, they are 
amazing. They're on the cutting edge of social change. We just need to give them the tools and they'll do the job. But that means some big changes to the way that we do things right now. And what do you think those changes will, will be in practical terms? What, and, and what can you do as mayor, if, if you were indeed elected, what can you do to bring those changes to the fore? So I think you can ask the government for our share of the £500 million they promised for youth services, which they've not yet delivered. And we need to put that together with the legacy programme for the Commonwealth Games and the City of Culture. That will give us um, a fund which we can use to start rehiring youth workers back in every neighbourhood. Now, councils need to do that, they need to shape that, and young people need to be part of that conversation. Second thing we then need to do is we need to say to the schools in the region and the city, right, who's up for joining a programme called Tomorrow's Engineers, where we begin giving you proper career counselling from the age of 12 and 13, where we um, bring in some teachers and some of the resources from our further education colleges, because actually they're often you know, equipped in, uh, with the latest technology, whether that is, you know, three, uh, 3D printing or these incredible CAD scanners that they've now got, but actually bringing that relationship much closer together. And crucially then, we need to allow young people to do the first couple of years of their technical degree at college, transfer the credits over to the university so that it's then much easier to get a degree level of skill while they're still uh, working. That could actually mean that by the age of 21, 22, they're about £100,000 better off because they'll have had a few years in the workplace and they won't be taking on £50,000 worth of uh, tuition fees and school debt. But crucially for us as a region, it means that we have many, many more engineers um, and people with a technical and professional education coming on stream each year. Um, on mental health services, what Andy Burnham has done is actually just start publishing the waiting lists. That's had quite a big impact already. There's no reason why we can't um, start doing that. And then when it comes to power, I think there's a couple of things we can do. So actually creating scrutiny panels that are made up of young people to oversee what the mayor does is um, really uh, a, a very simple thing that we can do. And frankly, we need to be encouraging more of our young people to go into politics themselves and actually start taking some of these decisions. So I think, y you know, there, there's a number of just sort of very practical changes that we can make that would make a big difference. Now, if we can afford to introduce free travel for young people, I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, that is something that we'd want to hear people's views about actually over the next couple of months. So on Friday, we are writing back out to about three or 400,000 people in the region to say, look, help us shape this next stage of our plan. Um, you know, we've already had one big consultation with the public over the last three months. We now want to go into a, a greater level of detail because, you know, the truth is I am asking for people's vote, but I'm also asking for their vision, their advice, their imagination. The only way that we're going to create a better future for our region is if we pull together to create it. Because frankly, right now, we can't rely on Downing Street to chart the right uh, path to progress. And do you think that we can? Um, there's been tremendous signs through the pandemic of people working together, and a, a new, refound sort of sense of community spirit. Is that going to go away when the vaccine works, if indeed it does? Um, or is there something we can do to keep that going? I think there is. I mean, a lot of people have talked to us. So we've asked people, um, what was the silver lining from lockdown? Was there anything? And the one thing that people said, so people talked about cleaner air, less traffic, less pollution, but the thing that topped the list was community spirit. And that's something that's always been part of the DNA in Birmingham, and it's something we've got to really drive hard behind over the next few years. So I think there's, there's two or three things that we can do, some big things and some small things. So I think we can use the Commonwealth Games and the Legacy Programme to train up a, um, a new generation of young Commonwealth leaders, young people in each of our neighbourhoods who are skilled up in the art of what Joe Cox, you know, our former MP who was murdered um, a few years ago, she had a great line which she used in the, her maiden speech actually. She said, look, we've got more in common than anything that divides us. We need to be training our young people in the art of bringing people together and that should be part of the legacy program for the Commonwealth Games. Second thing we can do, um, this is a particular frustration of mine. So I've had to spend years working with community groups in my constituency to get basic things sorted out like floodlights for football pitches so that they can take kids off the streets during the winter it's un it's an unbelievable struggle so we should be saying to sport england the arts council the lottery 
Heritage Lottery Fund, Football Foundation and the Premier League. Look, how much money are you prepared to invest in Birmingham over the next four or five years? OK, get your checkbooks out, let's put the money in the pot and let's have a fast track fund that community groups can bid to to get the money quickly. So frankly, they don't have to go through the struggle um, they have to go through today. The last thing, though, which is important and special is food. So if you look at the way Northfield Food Service was set up in Northfield after uh, their MP voted against free school meals, absolutely incredible. They had uh, the hall down there at the Baptist Church. They've got Digbeth Dining Club organising food. They've got volunteers coming out and taking the food out. There's something special about food. So one of the ideas we're looking at is something called a food justice network. Um, it's been developed by the co-op. Um, it's something they've got quite well organised in Coventry, actually, where they've got the um, Trussell Trust regional warehouse. Um, we need some facilities like warehousing, like chiller space, like a bit of a van fleet, so that we can actually help the brilliant community groups that we've got deliver on one really important pledge, which is no one in this city ever goes hungry. So, you know, we've got the community spirit, but there's, a, there's things that I've seen elsewhere in the West Midlands that we could be doing here that I think could make a big difference. And in terms of the local economy, a number of people have um, written in, talk about low productivity here in the West Midlands, that business confidence is very low. And obviously we, we do need a vibrant business sector to offer the employment and engineering opportunities to the, the young people that come through with skills. What could you do as West Midlands Mayor to um, support that and to, to help business improve its productivity in the West Midlands and, and not be a little bit of a laggard economy, which I think it has tended to be for a period of time. Well, it comes back to this point about this is not the time to be a prisoner of our modesty, frankly. We need to be a lot more ambitious about the future. And when we talk to people about how we create jobs for the future, people felt a little bit like they were on the horns of a dilemma. So they knew People know that we've got to go green. They know that's the future. They know the damage we're doing to the planet right now. But they worry that green is, is more expensive and that we might need to recover first and then go green. The way we square the circle is to say, look, our history, our legacy is in making things. So let's become the capital of green manufacturing. You know, we, we started the industrial revolution. We should now lead the zero carbon revolution. And if we do this in a way that means we make things here, that is good for manufacturing, it's good for jobs, and it's good for the planet. Now, the way in which we can make a move on this, I think, involves uh, three or four quite big moves. So first is around land, putting together green industry zones. Now, when I was the regional minister uh, about 10, 11 years ago, we created big business parks like Anstey um, uh, and like I-54 up near Wolverhampton. Um, so, you know, we've done this before, so I know that we can do it again. Creating green industry zones where you've got ready access to skills, green transport, recycling because zero waste is so important, um, and on-site renewable energy is the way that other places around the world like Shanghai are decarbonising their industry. There is going to be a bit of deglobalisation over the next few years for all sorts of reasons, not just Brexit. We need those supply chains to come here to the West Midlands and by setting out green business zones, I think we can do that. Second piece of the puzzle is then skills. That is absolutely crucial. Third is then power. We produce 0.3% of the country's renewable energy. We should be solaring up schools. We should be installing um, on sh onshore uh, wind turbines. Uh, we should be talking to companies about Rolls-Royce, about making those wind turbines um, here in the region. But crucially, we need the electric vehicle battery factory sorted out in Coventry. There's about 16 of these big battery factories now in Europe. France and Germany are putting nearly 2 billion euros into this. We need the government to come off the fence and actually put in place that battery factory on site. Otherwise, the automotive industry may well move offshore. And frankly, you know, from Matthew Bolton to Frank Whittle, we've known that power is the source of industry. So cheap access to renewable power um, I think is the third big thing that we need to do. And I think once you've got in place low-cost power, high-quality skills, um, land, then the final piece of the puzzle is using the power of public procurement to actually buy the things from here. So High Speed 2 is a good example. We should be building Britain's bullet trains in the black country. There's a 
tongue twister for you, but that is absolutely what we should be doing. We've got one of the worst electric vehicle charging infrastructures in the country. It's crazy. We should have the best electric vehicle charging infrastructure in the country. Very light rail. It's being made in Coventry. We need to be building tram lines. Maybe we should be using those budgets to buy very light rail from Coventry. Um, and crucially, we should be using the power of the NHS or the local council to be buying the kinds of electric vans that are now coming off the production <coughs> line at LEVC. So, you know, there, there are things that we can do to actually keep the public pound local because, frankly, if we buy it here, we can make it here. That's good for the environment, it's good for jobs, it's good for skills, it's good for productivity, it's good for our future as a region. And you mentioned Brexit there. Um, what, would you, what would you say to the government? Um, re reputedly, the Prime Minister is over in Brussels now. Uh, we're trying to clinch the possibility of a final deal, which may or, or may not happen. This region is a big exporter. We're a big exporter to Europe. We need that European market. What would, you, what would your advice be to government as to whether it should do a deal, whether it shouldn't do a deal? What, what should they be talking about and doing now that's best for the West Midlands? Get it done. I mean, that is the basic message. I mean, if you go back to the election last year, I remember reading um, you know, some of the leaflets that came out from the Conservative Party, and I remember... I remember what they said. They said, the deal is ready to go on day one. Well, <laughs> well, it's like two minutes to midnight now in the negotiations and the deal is still not done. If we, don't, if we get a no deal Brexit, it is a catastrophe for hundreds of thousands of manufacturing workers who are on furlough. You know, in Birmingham over the summer, we had half a million people on furlough, on the self-employment scheme, or already unemployed, 134,000 people unemployed. Um, a no deal Brexit on top of all that, that is double disaster for us. We will see unemployment worse than we've seen it since the 1930s. So there is an awful lot at stake now, I'm afraid, in just getting this deal over the line. And that has got to be the basic message. Think about our manufacturing industry. Think about the Midlands. Um, because frankly, we're going to lose hundreds of thousands of jobs if it's a no deal Brexit. And of course, one of the areas where uh, jobs have been disappearing fast and being cut back is on the high street where we have so much of it closed and, and if not closed, under threat. And a lot of it big time employers. And we're seeing Birmingham city centre, a vibrant place once, now becoming something of a ghost town. Yeah. Um, no, officers, no office workers there, nobody going in to buy their coffees. Um, is there anything as a, a newly elected and incoming mayor you could do to rejuvenate the high street, to bring back the city centre? How do you see the city centre prospering over the term of a mayor? Well, the first thing I say is not just the city centre. So I remember not long after I became an MP, one of the big projects I drove through was Shard End Crescent. It was a £42 million redevelopment in the middle of Shard End, Shard End. And that was about breathing new life, new public space back into the heart of our community. It's now the place where we do things like uh, Remembrance Day uh, every year, for example. So these spaces, these windswept derelict precincts around the city, need community life breathing back into them. We need markets, we need festivals, we need celebrations of things that we're proud of. If you think about things like um, Pride of Longbridge is a good example of the way a community rallied together to create a festival, festival around something that they were proud of. That's how we breathe the hubbub of community life, I think, back throughout the city. Now, the trick is reimagining city centres in a different way and thinking a bit more about this concept called the 15-minute world. And the 15-minute world was this idea that everything that you needed should be within a 15 minutes of, of where you live. And you know what? It was actually invented in Birmingham. So if you think about the arts and craft movement or Bourneville or the Moorpool estate, um, you know, these great revolutionaries of the 19th century, they built these things in Birmingham. So we should be pioneering this again. But the, the key is making sure there's a mix of things available so that it's not just office and it's not just retail, but actually there is places to live. There is culture. Um, there is um, startup space for entrepreneurs at a discounted rate. So we just, we've got to be, I think, a, a lot more imaginative. We've got to think even about the city centre in, in, terms, of, in terms of the village. And what you have in a village centre is, is not just one thing, you have lots of things. And that is going to be the idea that's got to be at the absolute core of the future city plan when it's launched next year. Now, 
The, the one thing I'd like to stress is the importance of culture. Culture is what brings us together. Culture, frankly, has been shortchanged over the course of this year. Um, four years ago, you may remember that uh, we were promised by a Conservative mayor that we would be front of the queue and hotline to Downing Street and special treatment. And frankly, this year, the only person we've seen get special treatment from the Prime Minister is Dominic Cummings. The arts and culture sector in this region got one of the worst per head payouts from government. So I don't know what's special about coming last, but frankly, we need a much bigger rescue plan for our arts and culture sector in the region, including the freelancers, because they're the people who make the culture in the first place. And when we're thinking about the fabric of our cities for the future, we need to be thinking about putting culture right the way through. Culture and green space, that's how we reinvent urban environments for the 21st century. It's interesting that you mention that because that again is a very big question that's come out from our um, viewers and listeners today um, asking specifically um, what powers you would have as a, uh, a mayor to be able to encourage heritage and, um, and cultural organisations. Is that something you can actually truly get involved with? Would you have powers that would enable you yeah. to reach in? Well, you know, what? so I'm a, I'm a doer, you know, and I'm, and I'm standing for, the, for this job because I'm profoundly frustrated uh, how we're being overlooked, overshadowed and, and left behind right now. Um, that's why I, I want to leave Parliament, actually, and, and come and do work as the mayor, because I think actually a mayor, what we need here in our region, is a mayor who stands up for the region and not stands by. Now, what I found when I was the regional minister, and I was the regional minister who pushed through the deal on New Street Station, is that you have three powers that are more important than anything else. You can convene, you can challenge and you can communicate. That's how we got New Street Station built, by frankly putting people in a room, knocking heads together, not letting people out until the deal was done. Now, I think we can do that with culture and I think there are some big things that, <laughs> that we should be celebrating. So, you know, we have this incredible artistic legacy here from, from Tolkien to Black Sabbath, uh, the home of the Industrial Revolution that now wants to lead the zero carbon revolution. One of the things that we need here is, are uh, some of the things will be smaller, like a house of metal to celebrate our history um, of, the, uh, of the heavy metal, um, of heavy metal and bands like Black Sabbath. But actually, I'd love to see a museum of science and industry that brings together the incredible story about our leadership in the Industrial Revolution. I want it married in some way to the new um, station that uh, we're building over there because when, when people arrive in Birmingham, I want them to know that they're arriving in the home of the Industrial Revolution in a city that is determined to now lead the zero carbon revolution. And I think celebrating that part of our culture, celebrating that part of our history to awaken the imagination about the future could be one of the things that we can really get right over the next few years. A lot of people have um, written in um, sending me questions about housing. Um, and in particular, um, how soon can we build zero carbon homes, which very much clicks into your agenda? Um, and how do we fund the cost differential, especially where the homes are used for low cost rents? Yeah. And sort of allied to that, um, affordable homes. Can we have a programme like London has had? Is that possible for us here in the West Midlands? Um, and how would you tackle the most challenging um, thing and this a number of people have raised this brownfield sites as opposed to greenfield sites yeah and um, a number of people have somebody particularly mentioned Yardley and said how can we make sure that our green sites are not lost when there's so many brownfield sites that could be developed but of course developers often like the easier touch which is the greenfield site well so exactly. there's sort of three elements to that no really. it's a brilliant so so first first things first we need to start building more council homes. So the number of homes for social rent that we've built in this region has fallen by over 80% since 2010. It's actually Birmingham City Council that's propping up the numbers across the region. In Walsall, you know, last year it was zero. So this is a real crisis of affordability for thousands of families, especially our young people. Now, the way in which we can help with this is the mayor is allowed to borrow at very, very cheap rates. I mean, the cost of government borrowing right now is pretty close to zero. The Treasury has said to the Mayor, look, you know what? You can borrow up to a billion pounds. We're only using 12% of that money. 
we're, we're, we're leaving 88% of the money on the table. Now, the mayor has brought forward a plan for a, a development vehicle, but he said it's not going to help build homes for social rent, and it's seeking a financial return of over 26%. That's like a, a private sector development vehicle. So this is nonsense. What we should be doing is creating a mayoral development corporation, what I've called a green development corporation, like they have in Greater Manchester, and using that to actually co-fund um, development of new homes, new communities around the region. And we should be building on Brownfield first. We have enough land, we have enough Brownfield land to actually build the homes that we need without losing the places that we love. Two things, though, that we need to throw into the mix. One, the mayor has compulsory purchase powers to assemble land, which at the moment he's, he's just not using. Um, and the second thing that we can do is obviously use transport. The mayor is, the, is basically the transport authority, and we're not connecting in um, the power that we've got to help subsidise homes for social rent and transport and land assembly. So, you know, these are things that, you know, mayors like Sadiq Khan and... Andy Burnham up in Greater Manchester are getting on with. Frankly, we should be getting on with them too. Okay. And what would your advice be to the government? I mean, you've been a cabinet minister, you know how government uh, works, and you have a very strong um, financial background, and undoubtedly. Um, what would you advise the government in terms of paying back or sorting out the debt that has obviously been huge mm. to date. Um, you've mentioned a number of programmes, all of which will require funding, more funding um, in the future. Um, so how are we going to handle that, that debt issue? Is it an issue? You may not think it is an issue. And what would you advise government to do about it? So borrowing costs are coming down significantly now, and um, Rishi Sunak made that really clear in the last budget. There's basically three ways that you deal with borrowing. One is growth, one is taxes, and one is cutting spending. Cutting spending is something that has hit us here in Birmingham really hard. City Council's had its budget halved over the last few years. It's why, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I don't remember food banks running out of food, yet that's exactly what happened to food banks in Hodge Hill a couple of years ago. That's when I started doing my food bank collecting work. Um, there do need to be um, some taxes for those who of us who are luckiest, those who are richest, should be paying slightly more in tax right now. But the key is growth. You know, if you look at the, the growth figures over the next couple of years, they're shocking, absolutely shocking. Why? Because we're not bringing government together to back industry to grow and create the jobs of the future. That's not a mistake they're making in France and Germany. So if you look at the... Um, 1.75 billion euros that the French and Germans are putting in to build the gigafactories of the future in France and Germany, they're making sure that they will have things like, you know, the electric batteries being made for the German and French car makers of the future. You know, after months and months of arguing, we still haven't got a deal sorted out here in the region. And crucially, they're much better in France and Germany at using the power of public procurement to buy things that are actually made there. Now, if you think about where we are in Birmingham and Coventry, think about the metal triangle between us, Derby and Nottingham, over to Stoke, down through the Black Country, through to, uh, through to back to Birmingham. That should be the green workshop of the world. That should be the place that is making the electric vehicles, the zero carbon railways, the jet zeros of the future. Electric vehicles last year, the global market worth 100 billion pounds forecast to increase sevenfold in the next five years. We're at the epicentre of the aerospace industry. Last year, the world spent £90 billion on aero products. We're at the core of £200 billion worth of investment going into high speed two and the rail system. Frankly, if we made the planes, trains and automobiles of the future, we would be creating the manufacturing jobs we need in this region. Where there's a will, there's a way. And I think what COVID has taught us is that we're no longer simply living in an era of change, this is now a change of era. And we can't rely on Downing Street to chart the path forward. We need to be, once again, masters of our own destiny. And how can we bring everybody together? This is a tremendously diverse city, a real rainbow city, and something that's been of, of concern to people writing in. I've, I've got a, a question here. 
um, about accommodating homeless individuals who have no recourse to public funds, either due to an asylum claim being refused um, or because they're EA nationals and there continues to be severe destitution among those groups, especially when COVID-related Section 4 asylum support ends. How, you have mentioned, it's anathema to you, the homeless. You, you've already said that, I know. But how do we really get down to the nitty-gritty with those, those groups who are being isolated and so badly treated? How do we reach them and deal with yeah, those? Yeah, I mean, it is something um, that's personal for me. I mean, some people know this story, but I, I um, back in 2015, um, I lost my dad to, to what was a lifelong struggle with alcohol. And... Um, it, it, for me, it was um, a moment of terrible um, personal shame that I, that I couldn't save him. And uh, not long after that, I began working with the homeless community here in Birmingham. And, and one evening, actually, it was not far from here, we met a chap who, who sort of reached into his pocket and he pulled out two bits of paper. And, and one was a bank statement because he wanted to show us he was a good person and paying into a bank. And, and the other was the prescription for his mental health drugs. And he couldn't, he couldn't read it because he couldn't read. And he, he then began telling us the story about the abuse that he had suffered as a child and how he was now self-medicating that pain with drugs and alcohol. And, and for, me, for me, that's when the penny dropped. That's exactly what my dad was doing. My dad slipped into alcoholism after he lost my mum to cancer when she was 52, a bit older than me. Um, and that, for me, is when the penny dropped. And, 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 and since then, you know, I've done whatever I can to, to just go and help and raise the issues in, in Parliament. And actually, the, the trigger for me standing for mayor was when we were out with one church group and, you know, in that underpass between New Street and um, Moore Street, we, we found a man who'd double amputee. Uh, he'd been on the ground there for two or three days. And... Um, he was still in his hospital gown with, with a hospital tag on his wrist. And it then took us two hours to get an, an ambulance. And, you know, for me, you know, that is, that is when I just said, look, I'm not, I'm not prepared to bring up a family and, and serve in a city where we have homeless people lying in underpasses in hospital gowns. So the lessons that we need to learn do come from um, everybody in which is the program that's kept homeless people off the streets during COVID and in somewhere warm and safe. But the truth is, we're not going to end homelessness in, city, in this city unless we change the no recourse to public fund rules. Many of the people that I meet when I work in um, soup kitchens here um, have no recourse to public funds. And only government can change that. We have to campaign to change that. But there are steps that we can take ourselves by making sure that there is an abundance of places to house people. And that isn't just about houses, by the way. Um, there's a good friend of mine who runs homeless services in Wolverhampton, and he says, we're not trying to end houselessness, we're trying to end homelessness, we're trying to make homelessness history. A home is where the heart is, it's where you have a wealth of relationships, where people cherish you, where you feel love, support and nurture. My dad didn't end up on a pavement because actually he had me and the family who picked him up when things go wrong. Many people who are homeless today don't have that treasure, don't have that privilege. And so this is something that I believe that we can solve by working together as a community in Birmingham. But the government needs to change the law. And the sooner they do that, the sooner we will end homelessness. And looking at where we are now, um, you speculated when we started that there could be potentially a 40% increase in um, unemployment in, in <coughs> coming months. And it's, it's probably not possible to prevent that happening and there's going to be a hiatus then isn't isn't there we can attempt to deal with it but there's going to be a gap how do we speed that process up how do we stop that gap is there anything we can do if this sudden arising of all these unemployed people emerges in, yeah. in the new year or in the spring or whenever yeah, it is something we can do. what what can we do to we can start punching our weight and we can stop pulling our punches which is what we're doing right now so, look, what people want in this region is a mayor who stands up for the region, not just stands by. You know, we were promised special treatment, a magic hotline to Downing Street. Well, look at what's happened. They forgot to send us the vaccine yesterday. They literally forgot to send Birmingham the vaccine. 
we've got just 5% of the £3 billion we asked for to keep the region working. We got just 7% of the budget for capital, uh, for shovel-ready projects, even though we're 9% of the population. We got the worst handout uh, bailout for the arts and culture sector. Even the mayor in his own annual report last year boasted that he had built his transport achievement was building a mile and a quarter of tram track. Well, look, there's snails that travel five times further in a year than that. And worst of all, £123 million of capital projects delayed. Those projects could support 7,500 jobs in the middle of a recession. So look, I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm standing for mayor because I'm frustrated at the dither and delay. And as a region, we're simply not punching our way. And you know, as someone who has been in the Treasury, who has helped run Downing Street, who drove through New Street Station, who has driven hundreds of millions of pounds of investment into my constituency, I know it doesn't have to be like this. But the thing that is different is you have to build a team. That's how I turned a majority of 460 into the biggest parliamentary majority in the West Midlands. Because frankly, I give the credit, I don't take the credit. I, sure, I like a selfie as much as anybody else, but I also believe in rolling my sleeves up and getting things done. And crucially, I believe in standing up for my community, not standing by. And that's what we've got right now. And frankly, that's why we're falling behind. And that we cannot afford another three or four years of. Liam Byrne, thank you very much for coming down to Millennium Point. We're coming to the um, end of, of our time. It's been a very interesting afternoon. And to everybody out there, thank you very much indeed for listening in. I hope you found it instructive and enjoyable. And I hope you'll join us again when on future occasions we have similar events. So from Millennium Point for today, goodbye. <laughs>